dads to be. Happy Father's Day. Um, do we want to honor you this morning? Um, you know, I know that, you know, and I'm, I'm going to get into my message in a minute, so I don't want to jump ahead too much, but, you know, it, the, the challenges and the battles are out there in the world. And, you know, there's a time for, you know, kind of understanding both sides of a battle and things like that, but there's a time when we need to stand in the gap. And I believe today is that day. Today, this time that we're living in right now, Christian men need to take a stand. And so we just want to pray that God will continue to strengthen you men. And uh, we want to recognize you and honor you. Now, I know when we did this for, for um, Mother's Day, uh, we, we pat everybody, write their names, we put them in here, and then we're just going to pick some names out. We have some Home Depot gift cards. Sorry, guys, I know you were looking forward to the flowers, but <laughs> we opted to go for the Home Depot gift cards instead. So, uh, Jim, if you can come up and just help me with this. Um, I was looking forward to the flowers. Let's do it one at a time. All right, when we call your name, when we call your name, just please come on up. Chris Fulos. Right. Thank you. Smith would work well here. And Tom Englehart. Come on, Tom. He wants to trade this for Dick's sporting goods. Is there a golf club you have your eye on? Amen. Again, happy Father's Day to all the dads. Um, we'll, give, we'll give announcements at the end of the service, so um, we'll make a note of that. Let's turn to the book of Ephesians this morning. The book of Ephesians, chapter number 6. The value of a godly father. The value of a godly father. Now, let me just encourage you this morning. You know, it is Father's Day. And, and we do want to honor and recognize the dads. But, you know, I believe that this message is applicable and relevant to every one of us. Um, you know, God has so designed things. Everyone has a role in God's perfect plan. Everyone has a function in God's perfect plan. But all those functions, all those roles work together. All things work together for good. And so... You know, sometimes we, you know, we, we, we hear messages and like, oh, that doesn't really apply to me or maybe that's not for me. You know, God's word is relevant to all of us. And God's word is, a, is practical and relevant for every situation. Uh, just reading some stuff this week uh, for a class that I'm taking. And, and that's the truth. There, God's word has the answers for <coughs> everything. Amen. You know, you hear, well, it does, it's, it's, it's not practical to the year 2021. That's a lie of the devil. Because God's word has the answer for everything that we need. If we're willing to look for it. And if we're willing to allow the Holy Spirit of God to work in us. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read the first four verses. The Bible says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you once again for the word of God. Thank you for this time that we can open up the word. And Lord, I just pray that you would again speak to us in a very powerful way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm just going to get a drink of water, all that singing and talking. <laughs> all right. We have been convinced in today's day and age because of the culture, because of mainstream media, because of Hollywood, Okay, that dads are portrayed in many instances as bumbling fools. 
You look at situational comedies in today's day and age, and I don't recommend you watch many of them, I'll tell you the truth. But if you just get the premise of what many of these shows and movies portray, they don't portray fathers in the light and the way God designed fathers to be. It's one of those portrayals that you hear it often, often enough, and you see it often enough, you start to think that that's the majority of what's going on. And it does go on. But that is not God's design for the Father. God has a very specific plan and design for dads. Don't allow yourself to be fooled into thinking that that portrayal you see on television or that portrayal you see, listen, media today, news outlets, news media, this is across the board. This is not liberal, conservative. It's across the board. Their one objective is to get an audience. And they will do whatever they need to do to get an audience. And most of the time, it is with shock value. So they're not going to tell you the stories about the dads that go out of their way to spend time with their children. They're going to portray them and put situations where dads are not being dads. And you hear these horrific stories and you start to think to yourself, man, there's no hope. Man, there's no, there, there's, there's no, there's no, no, no light at the end of the tunnel. But you know what? If you listen to the word of God, if we listen to our children and to children, and by the way, there's a lot of children in this church and that we have contact with, it could be grandchildren, it could be, you know, it could be nieces and nephews, that we have an impact on. And so this, this truth is applicable to them as well. Now, listen, I understand that your, your uh, level of influence is not going to be that of a mom or dad, but you still have an impact in their life. I, read, I did some, some research on this because I was curious about certain things. They said, in a survey they took, they, they surveyed, I think it was a thousand kids, and they said that 73%, hear me on this, 73% of kids they, they survey want to spend more time with their parents. More time with their parents. They don't want to spend more time in front of a television with a video controller in their hand. They want to spend more time with their parents. There's a couple of other studies they did, just to give you an idea. 82% of studies that they've done on father involvement and child well-being published since 1980 found, quote, significant associations between positive father involvement and offspring well-being. Here's another quote. Positive father care is associated with more pro-social and positive moral behavior in boys and girls. This is borne out by research from the University of Pennsylvania, which indicates that children who feel a closeness and warmth with their father are twice as likely to enter college, 75% less likely to have a child in their teen years, 80% less likely to be incarcerated, and half as likely to show various signs of depression. Yet we allow ourselves to be convinced that our value is minimal. In a 26-year-long study, researchers found that the number one factor in developing empathy in children was father involvement. 26 years they studied this. And the number one thing that builds empathy in our children, that's compassion for others. Kind of like put yourself in other people's shoes and understand how people feel. Being empathetic. The number one factor in children developing empathy was father involvement. Yet you look at what you see in the media and on TV today, and it's completely the opposite. And it, and it really saddens me, and to some extent it makes me angry. Because it's diminishing the role that God has so designed for fathers, and for the family. And for the family. And, listen, the devil is destroying Society. He is destroying the church by destroying the family. If you destroy the family, listen, our church is made up of families. And when you destroy the family, it impacts the church. And when you impact the church, it impacts the nation. And it's just the way it is. So I'm going to encourage you, we're going to look at three relationships this morning. We're going to look at three relationships this morning. 
and pray that this is a blessing to you because, you know, I think that I believe that we have at times developed a wrong view of that. So let's look at this. The first one is a father's relationship with his family or to his family. A father's relationship to his family. There is a proper relationship that dads are going to have with their family. D.L. Moody said it this way. A man ought to live so that everybody knows he is a Christian. Did I not put that up there? Maybe I didn't. Oh, there it is. A man ought to live so that everybody knows he's a Christian. And most of all, his family ought to know. By the way, it is not a sign of weakness when a man says, I love Jesus. It is not a sign of weakness when we live for Christ. It is not a sign of weakness when people mock us for our faith. It's a sign of strength. Because we're willing to stand for what we believe in. And our children need to see that. That's why I said at the beginning, I said, listen, there's a time to, you know, to kind of reach out the olive branch. And I believe we need to witness and love and compassion. I believe that with all my heart. But I do not believe that we need to sacrifice the principles that God teaches us through his word for the sake of reaching others. That is never, never in the scriptures. Jesus Christ was always compassionate. He didn't compromise. He spoke. He taught the truth in love. You say, well, that's a hard thing to do. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. And we need to teach our children to love, to love Jesus Christ. What is our relationship? So letter A is we need to demonstrate love. What's our relationship with our families? What's a father's relationship to his family? It needs to demonstrate love. First of all, it needs to demonstrate love to his wife. It's a sacrificial love. It's a sacrificial love. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 and 28, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's a sacrificial love. In verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. That's a biblical truth. Our children need to see us love our wives. You say, well, why? Because that is the foundation for how they will love their spouses. They need to see a love, a genuine Christ-like love that you demonstrate to your wife. And by the way, it goes both ways. I think this is sometimes more of a challenge for for men, we're not quite as emotional. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way in any way. But sometimes, you know, it, it, it's kind of a funny thing. When it comes to emotions and things like that, a lot of times we don't like to talk about it. Unless we're on a basketball court or baseball field, and we're very emotional people. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong for demonstrating love to our spouses that our children see. I don't say we do it to put on a show. But it should be part of our normal, everyday behavior in our families. They need to see that. Because they will develop the same habits that they see you doing. If they, if they see a husband and a wife constantly being disrespectful to one another, what do they think? They're going to think, well, that's perfectly normal. My mom and dad do it. Why shouldn't I do it? But if they see mom and dad putting the other first before themselves, they see the sacrificial love. Guess what? They're going to think that that's the normal. And there's a lot of things in the world that are abnormal. We need to show them at home what is normal. We need to demonstrate love to our wife, to our children. You know, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 13 talks about the type of love. Beareth all things. You go through, I'm not going to go through the whole list of things, but you know what, what love is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. When the prodigal son returned. What was the first thing his dad did? Did he scold him? Did he berate him? Did he discipline him? What, what, did, what was the first thing he did? He hugged him. He embraced him. He hugged him so hard. I mean, you just get the picture of what was going on there. He ran to him. Why? Because he loved him. And he was showing, it was a genuine love that he was showing to his children. 
It's okay. It's okay to hug our kids. It's okay. It's okay to demonstrate love to them. We need to do that. If we don't demonstrate and show our children love as a family, they're going to go seek it somewhere else. They will go seek it somewhere else. And typically, it'll be in all the wrong places. We need to show them love. Psalm 103, 13 says, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And that pitieth means to show compassion. You know, as God has compassion, God will have compassion on us as we have on our children. We need to encourage our children. Fathers, it says, and fathers, provoke ye not your children to wrath. But then what does he say? But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, what do those words mean? You know, those are great verses, but what do they mean? Well, nurture means instruction which is aimed at increasing virtue. It's a chastening. But there's a purpose behind it. The purpose is that you try or attempt to increase virtue with your children. We're trying to teach them how to live godly lives. We want to bring them into nurture and admonition. Admonition means exhortation. It is a mild rebuke or warning. Listen, there is always a purpose behind. If we have to correct our children, there should always be a purpose behind it. It should not just be, boy, I'm glad I got that off my chest. That is the wrong reason. But if our purpose is, man, I want to guide them back to the things that God would have them to do. I'm trying to, listen, they don't know a lot of times. So it's our responsibility to love them, to encourage them. And sometimes a mild rebuke is necessary. I, you know, <laughs> as parents, listen, we need discernment constantly. You know that. This is not, you know, theology 401 college level. We need to encourage our, ch our children constantly. And we need the wisdom of God to know how to make decisions. I mean, how many times in bringing up your children did you say, I have no idea what to do? How many times did we say, oh, we need to go to the Lord in prayer because we don't have a clue? That's okay. That's a good thing. We're dependent upon the one who has all that. But we need to encourage them. You know, just saying, do this because I said so, there's a time and a place for that. I get it. But what is the purpose behind it? Is there an ultimate goal? Is there an ultimate purpose? The purpose is we need to encourage them. You know, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 21, a similar verse, almost kind of a sister passage to the verses in Ephesians, it says, um, let me see, where am I? Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. But look what it says, lest they be discouraged. We never want to discourage our children. Just like I said before, if we discourage them, they will seek encouragement somewhere else. Why is it that the rate and the growth of gangs in America is so high. It's because they're looking for acceptance from anyone because they don't receive the acceptance at home. Now, I'm not saying if we, you know, if we don't do everything exactly right, our children are going to return to gangs. That's not what I'm talking about. But the idea is many of those teenagers and young people that turn to gangs, it's because there was no encouragement, there was no acceptance, there was nothing, there was no one they could turn to. So here comes this group, and they're willing to accept them as they are. We know that there's a wicked motivation behind it. And they're accepted, and for the first time in their life, they feel like they belong to something, and they turn to them. That is what the family is supposed to do. We are to encourage, to love our children. So we are to demonstrate love to our wives and to our children. Now listen, there is a time to discipline. There is a time. And the book of Proverbs talks about it extensively. Okay, I'm not saying that, well, we just let them do whatever we're, oh no. No. Absolutely not. Proverbs 3.11 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. Here it is. For whom the Lord loveth, he corrected. Even as a father the son in whom he delighted. It's not done out of hatred, bitterness, anger, it's done because you love them. <coughs> it is not wrong to set up boundaries in your children's lives. 
it's not wrong. That's a demonstration of love. God sets boundaries up in our life. And oftentimes we fight against those boundaries. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, sheep. The, the, the illustration is sheep. And sheep are always penned in. Why? Because if you don't pen them in, they're just going to wander off and they'll get attacked and destroyed by wolves. And we know that the Bible talks about the wolf and the, 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 the destruction. And so, you know, God sets up boundaries in our life. And as loving dads, we need to set boundaries in our children's life. And, and listen, it's not always going to be met with approval. <laughs> I mean, you could probably count on one hand the number of times our children said, Mom, Dad, I'm so thankful you didn't let me know do what I wanted to do. You're the best. Thanks. I, I, I never did it. <laughs> I don't think ever. That doesn't make it any less right. God has given that role to the parents to be that with, to provide that wisdom, to provide that discernment, to provide that guidance, to provide that leadership in their lives. Because if they are left unchecked, just walk through a department store, Walmart, one of these other stores, and you'll see what happens. And it breaks my heart, but you know we have a culture and a society today where the main purpose and the main goal is to give the children the Put the, to put the children at an equal level with their parents. God never designed that. There is a structure in God's plan for the family. Okay, and that structure is, you know, mom and dad are at the top of the pyramid. Dad, mom, and then the children. Society doesn't like that. That's why, you know, you see the government trying to strip parents of their responsibilities. Okay? I had a, a someone I met with this week looking at the school. I made fun of it last week. And... They were asking me about different things, and you know, the conversation came up about how we deal with you know, discipline issues and things like that. And we, I told them, like I tell every family, I said, listen, if we have to deal with a situation, we deal with it. But we are not the primary you know, caregivers for your children. You are. We are here to support what you are to be doing at home. So we're just here to be a help. We just come alongside. It is not my responsibility to be the primary caregiver for the children. That, 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 may, that may sound terrible. Oh, what does that mean? I love these kids. I absolutely do. However, God designed it so that mom and dad are the ones that are going to take care and raise their children. That's the way God designed the plan. And that's the way God wants it to be. Listen, it is not, you know, TV's responsibility to raise your children. It is not the government's responsibility to raise your children. And that is what is starting to happen today. And it's about time that we stand up and say no. Because thus saith the Lord. So, we need to demonstrate love. We need to determine to lead. Determine to lead. Joshua 24, 15, a verse that many of us are familiar with. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Joshua said, listen, you need to make your own choice. You need to decide whether you're going to serve the, serve the God of heaven or the gods of the Amorites. That's your decision. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. Joshua stood up and he said, this is what we're doing. Men, we need to stand up and say, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. <clears throat> we will be in church when it's time to worship the Lord. We will be involved in serving God in whatever capacity God has called us to serve Him. We will love God with all our heart. We need to stand up and make that decision. We need to be determined to lead. Leadership starts with you, men. And that, that's across the board. Dads, grandfathers, uncles, men in the church. Leadership starts with you. Many times we live today in a culture where we're just pushing leadership aside, letting somebody else do it. Well, if somebody else can do it, you don't really need me. How about we get back to, hey, I want to be that person. I want to lead. I want to lead my family. Make that decision to lead. Be a, be a mentor. Determine to lead, but be a mentor. 
<laughs> Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7 says, The just man walketh in his integrity, his children are blessed after him. Here's a great quote from Charles Spurgeon. <coughs> Charles Spurgeon says, Train up a child in the way he should go, but be sure you go that way yourself. Train up a child in the way you should go, but be sure you go that way yourself. Listen, we can we can talk till we're blue, blue in the face. Okay, we can talk till we're blue in the face, but they're going to do what we do more than what we tell them to do. What does that mean? We need to lead by example. How do we do that? By preparing them? Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. We need to train them. When they're younger, we tell them what to do. As they get older, we tell them and show them what to do. And when they get older than that, we allow them to do it and we come alongside and help them. So when they're older, they will continue to do the things that you've shown them to do. But we need to mentor them by preparing them, by teaching them. The Bible says in Deuteronomy that we are to teach them. You say, well, you know, we teach them. They, they know their math, and that's good. And they know their English, and they know their history. And they didn't get history for me because history wasn't my thing. Math I could do. History for me. What about the things of God? The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter number 6, And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up all the time. We need to teach our children the word of God. When? When you get up, when you go to sleep, when you're walking. Every moment, teach them the word of God. When they're making a decision, teach them the word of God. Not when they're having a situation in school, turn to the word of God. There is nothing greater you will do than to teach your children a love for the word of God. They need to have a love for the word of God. We can make them read the word of God, just like somebody can make us read the word of God. You know, the pastor said, hey, we're going to start checking from now on, and we want to make sure that everybody's reading at least one chapter from the Bible every week. You'll read it, because you don't want to have to tell pastor, yeah, pastor, I didn't do it. But do we want to do it? We can make our children do it, but you know what? When, when, you, when you read that, that verse, train up a child in the way he should go, the, the understanding of that verse is give them a thirst for it. That's what that verse is really kind of translated to. Give them a thirst for the things of God, and when they're old, they're going to desire it. They're going to continue to desire it. But if we just make them do it because I said so, you know, when they're out making their own decisions, you know, we want a lasting impact. We want something that's going to impact them for the rest of their lives. i got to move on. So prepare them, teach them. We already talked about it. Encourage them. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Second Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's encourage our children. So that's a father's relationship with his family. How about a child's relationship to his father? There is a biblical plan for how children are supposed to interact with their family. Okay, first is obedience. Oh no, here we go. I hate this part. For for nine and a half months of the year I hear that. You know, we don't as adults like to obey all the time. You know, when we read something in the Bible and God says, Hey, do this, thus saith the Lord, or thou shalt we don't like that sometimes, do we? That's our, our, our flesh fighting the spirit. <coughs> Flesh is strong. Listen, going to church every week, Wednesday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, praying, getting in your Bible, those are all valuable importance. But don't think that for one minute the devil isn't sitting there going, oh yeah, wait till you get filled up with pride. Or wait till you have one <coughs> week moment. I'm waiting. And very quickly we can fall like that. We need to be on our guard all the time. Why? Because the flesh is weak. 
The flesh is weak. It, listen, it doesn't. It could take six months to develop a, a strong spiritual walk. It could take longer than that, but it would only take two days a day to destroy that. We need to be careful. We need to be on guard. We need to obey. Proverbs chapter 4. Hear you children the instruction of the Father and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. Listen, when we teach, as in the previous point, when we teach the word of God, that's good doctrine. It's needful doctrine. Our children need to know that. If they don't make decisions based on what the word of God says, they're going to make decisions based on what the world says. So, wouldn't we want to give them the instruction that they need to make good, sound decisions? Why? Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. It's just right. Well, what does that mean theologically? It means not wrong. Don't read more into it. It's the right thing to do, to obey your parents. What if I don't understand why I need to obey them? Obey them anyway. See, that verse doesn't go on to say, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right, but only if they're correct. And I know, okay, I know that there are many children who believe, and I, I think they believe this, in their heart of heart, that they are smarter than their parents. Listen, it, it's just the culture we live in. And that, listen, it doesn't matter whether they're five years old or whether they're 15 years old, they still think they're smarter than how many times have you heard, I, you don't understand. <laughs> I was taught that you have no clue. <laughs> Believe me. Your parents have wisdom that God has given to them through experiences, through the word of God, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, to pass that wisdom along to you to help you. I always tell the kids this. I said, your parents are not there to harm you. They love you and they're there to protect you. But they listen to friends who tell them, don't listen to your parents. If you ever have a friend who ever tells you, don't listen to your parents, run from them. Don't ever, ever, ever listen to someone who tells you, don't listen to your parents. Because they are not looking for your best interest. Period. That's all I'm going to say about that. <clears throat> Got to keep moving along. So, obey. Obey. You, be, you obey your parents because it's well-pleasing to the Lord. Colossians 3.20 tells us. <clears throat> obey your parents, for this is well pleasing to God. You know, God is pleased when you obey. You mean if I just listen to my parents, God's pleased? Yes, that's exactly what that means. So obey your parents. Honor your parents. Honor thy father and thy mother. That's in the Old Testament. You say, well, that's the Old Testament. Well, go to Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 2 and 3. You know, right after it says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. What is the next verse? Word. Honor. That it may be well, I'm sorry, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment we promised, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long with the earth. Honor means to place a high value on them. Do you value your parents? Do you place a high value on them? Honor them. It, that word honor is imperative mood. That basically means it is a command. It is not optional. It isn't for that time only. It is a continual command to honor your parents parents. That's not the most popular opinion today. I understand that. So what? We do it because God says to do it. And I'm not trying to be harsh and unloving, but the reality is so we just need to get back to doing what God says. We need to stop trying to reason God away. We need to stop trying to explain the word of God away and just start doing what God says. You know, when we were first saved, and we don't, you know, I'm not just speaking in general terms, when we were first saved, we didn't understand everything the Bible said. Most of us just said, well, God said, I'm just going to do it, and I'll figure it out later. That was a lot better than when we try and figure it out, and then I'll do it. Think about that. Just do it. If God chooses in his, in his omniscience, and if he chooses in his, in his infinite wisdom to share with you why he told you to do that, so be it. But if he doesn't, it doesn't mean you don't do it. We still need to obey we need to honor. We need to live. What do I mean by that? Well, it's one thing to hear what the Word of God says. It's another thing to live it out. And we, children, you need to live the things that your parents are teaching you. Proverbs 1, 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not thy law of, the mother, of thy mother. Proverbs 13, 1. Again, the idea of hear means to take heed to. 
Okay, um, Proverbs 13, a wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. That idea means to hear, to take heed to, to live and do the things that you have heard. It's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to put it into action. So children, obey, honor, and live. So a father's relationship to his family, a child's relationship to his father, and finally, a father's relationship with his God. And this one is the most vital. This is the most critical one. Because as your relationship goes, so goes your relationship with your family. As your relationship with your God goes, so goes your relationship with your family. We can't lead in areas of spiritual things if we ourselves are not walking with God. It just doesn't work. So we need to make sure that our walk is right with God. And when you do that, leading your family, you will find it becomes much easier. <clears throat> you will find that it is second nature. It's not something you have to force or think about. <coughs> First thing is this, you need to love God. You need to love God. You say, well, that's, that's basic stuff. Of course it is, but do we do it? Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verses 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Jesus Christ himself said it. Love the Lord thy God. We need to love God. He says, with all thy heart. That is with everything that's in you, you need to love God. You need to love God more than anything else. You need to be willing to give up everything for him. Think about the rich young ruler. Was he willing to, live, to give up everything? No. Well, you know what? He loved his possessions more than he loved God. Therefore, he didn't love him with all his heart. We need to love God with all our hearts, with all our soul. That means give our life to him in service. That doesn't mean he's going to send you somewhere that you're never going to see your family again. That's not what that means. But be willing to give your life to Christ to, for him to do as he will with your life. In whatever area of ministry it is. Whatever. But be willing to do that. Then he says, with all thy mind. Love the Bible. Love God's instructions more than we do our own wills. Do we love? Listen, if it came down to a decision between what the word of God says and what we want to do, what would we choose? Think about that. Because... You know, if we just thought about it superficially, we'd say, well, of course I'm going to listen to the Word of God. But you know, there's many times when we make decisions that we know are not lining up with what God would have us to do, but we do it anyway. We do it anyway. I have kids that come into me at school, and they'll ask my, you know, they'll ask my advice from time to time. They'll say, oh, I have an opportunity to get this job, but I'm not sure, Pastor, you know, and I'm like, well, what's going on? And they'll say, well, you know, they, they need me to work Sundays. And I try not to be judgmental, I really do, because it's a decision they have to make. We give them the information. We give them the counsel and let them make their own choice. I say, what do you think God wants you to do? That's a, that's a good question, by the way, we can ask ourselves. What do you think God wants us to do? And when he says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, that's exactly what he's talking about. But I really need a job. I'm trying to, I'm trying to buy a car. And in their mind, they're thinking, car, car, car. This is what's on the front of their mind. And it's the way a lot of times we think. And I always try to encourage and say, listen, God would never, ever open up a door for you that he would want you to walk through that goes against his word. He wouldn't do that. But he, if, you, if, you, if you honor God by obeying him, he will bless you in ways you can't even imagine. He, he'll provide a job you can't even see. He might even provide a job making more money. But we need to honor him by obeying him and loving him. We need to fear God. We need to fear God. We need to fear God. Proverbs 14, 26, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. We need to get back to a, a reverential fear of God. Here's a couple of quotes for you. Oswald Chambers said this, The remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Right. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. 
Listen, if we have a proper fear of God, we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. If we fear God, what does fear mean? Be trembling in a corner, cold sweat? No, it means you have a reverential fear of who God is, an awe of who God is. He is, as we sang this morning, almighty, unchangeable God. But we look at God as this mystical, distant being who sometimes is there. We ring the bell when we need him, and sometimes he answers, sometimes he doesn't. That's not who God is. He is almighty, all-powerful, omniscient, omnipresent. A.W. <laughs> Tozer said, when men no longer fear God, they transgress his laws without hesitation. Right. If there's no fear of God, we do whatever we want to do. The fear of consequences is no deterrent when the fear of God is gone. Men, we need to fear God. Our children need to see us fear God. You know, at the end of Solomon's life, what was his conclusion in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13? He made a conclusion. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. <laughs> After everything Solomon did, he came to the conclusion, fear God and keep his word. Very simple. Fear God and keep his commandments. And Solomon, if you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, there was a mess there. Vanity, how many times does he say vanity of vanities? Vanity of vanities. And then he gets to the end and he says, fear God. We need to get back to fearing God and who he is. Amen. Matthew Henry wrapped it up this way. The root of religion is fear of God reigning in the heart and a reverence of his majesty. A deference to his authority and a dread of his wrath. Fear God. That is, worship God, giving the honor to his name in all the instances of true devotion, inward and outward. That's what fearing God is. So love God, fear God, and model Christ. I don't have time to go through all this, but when you build a house, there's a lot of houses being built these days. The prices of lumber and everything else is going through the roof. When those people build a house from scratch, there's an architect design. There's a blueprint that they use to build that house. They don't just grab a bunch of two-by-fours, throw them up, and hope, hope the house stands up. You wouldn't want to live in a house like that. Well, guess what? For the Christian, we have a blueprint, too. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. John 13. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. You know, Christ set the example for us. He humbled himself. I'm not washing another person's feet. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to humble myself to do that. That's degrading. I'm not doing that. The Savior did it. First hey. Corinthians, Paul writes, "Be ye followers of me, as he follows Christ." He didn't say, "Follow me," because look at how good I am. He says, "As I follow Christ, follow me." Hey, it's not a bad thing to look for the example of someone who is living a godly life. There was plenty of people in our lives when we were young Christians who encouraged us, who modeled Christ, who lived lives that demonstrated who Christ is. And then finally, in Ephesians 5.2, it says, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. As Christ loves us, that's how we need to demonstrate love to others. Man, let me encourage you this morning. Be an example. Be an example. Model Jesus Christ in your life all the time. Walk in love. Encourage your children. Have a relationship with 73% of children said they desire to spend more time with their parents. That doesn't last long. Take advantage of it. Spend time with them. Spend time with them just you know doing fun things. Spend time with them doing spiritual things. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, we'll uh, we're gonna do a Bible game today, guys. Well, you can be excited about it. <laughs> be there. Be an example. Man, be an example. Lead. People are looking. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what TV says. I know what the Word of God says. Amen. And that's what we need to use as our guide, as our blueprint for living as godly men. Because there is a value in being a godly father. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for each and every one of these men that are here. I pray you would bless them. I pray you would give them a great day today, Lord. I pray they would realize, Lord, how important they are in the hand of God. The influence, the impact they can have on so many lives. And I pray that you would bless them. Protect them this morning. And Lord, drive, bring them to you, Lord. Draw them to you, Lord. 
that their lives would be a reflection of the love of Jesus. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's just sing one verse of our invitation here, which I believe is near or still near. Maybe. Yes, near or still near. Let's stand up. Let's just sing the first verse of near or still near this morning. October 1st, 2nd, please sign up. BBS is coming up. There are still some lawn signs. If you're going to take one, take a sign in two states. Just sign your name so we know who has them because we're going to reuse them year after year. Um, BBS. There is a BBS meeting next Sunday. Okay, so please make a note of that. 515 next Sunday. So if you are planning on helping in any capacity in BBS, please be here. Old team room, 515 uh, next week. Uh, we'll make announcements again tonight and later this week. Thank you so much for being here, and let's pray. God, thank you so much again for all that are here. Thank you, Lord, for your many, many blessings. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, and I pray you would, again, put a special blessing upon each of the men, the dads, granddads, uncles, and just bless them in a mighty way that they know they are are loved, and Lord, they have a special place in your plan. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.